This is the Lean Builders Hoots on the Ground podcast with absolutely, positively no bullshito. Join us as we dig into exactly what lean construction is and how we can use these concepts and strategies in the field. This podcast will be different as we journey to job sites and mine the minds of lean builders, all in effort to pass forward building knowledge from those who have put their time in to learn a better way. Because that's just what lean builders do. What's up, y'all? Adam Hoots here, the lean builder, Hoots on the ground with no bullshito, coming to you from Denver, Colorado with Advancing Construction Operational Excellence 2022. Boy, that's a mouthful. That's almost <laughs> as many words as our presentation. Does. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, coming no script through, either. No, yeah, no doubt. Coming to you with Mr. Dan Reynolds and Gil Bain. Um, yeah, I met you here, Dan, and have been just blown away by your lean leadership, as I would call it, and your service to the industry. And would love to just get your story out there, hear a little bit about who you are as a person. Take that in any direction that you want. Who, who is Dan Reynolds? Well, let's see. I've been asked that question before. I'm not sure how I've ever answered that, but you know, more than anything, I would say, you know, Adam, I'm from my roots of the Midwest. I grew up in Iowa, I spent all my early years. I went to school there. There's a part of the Midwest that's still near and dear to me, even though I've worked all over the world. That part of it still, I think, you know, resides in me. There was a there was a saying that my father used to use, and it was you know, basically <clears throat> quiet competence. You don't need to be the person jumping up on the table, but be the person that's gonna offer and be there and just, <clears throat> you know, be, be able to contribute probably more than anything. So Midwest guy, you know, seven or eight moves in my career. I'm a family guy, been married for 36 years. You can do it in this industry, but you have to have those grounding roots, I, I think, to survive. This, this industry is not easy, so you got to have that safeguard. Between three kids and now two grandchildren, it keeps me pretty grounded. That's so amazing. that's a little bit about who I am and probably what makes me tick. Quiet competence. I love that. I, I can see that. I feel that in you. And I'm, I'm watching your presentation this morning, which was fabulous. The, the kickoff, the keynote to the whole thing. And, and so there were a couple of times when people and trust and just respect for people, behaviors, like all this kind of comes up. And all of a sudden it wasn't Dan so quiet competence. It was like Dan's going to speak up and like I even heard you pounding on the microphone a couple of times. Tell me, where does that come from? What is that about? What's the root there? You know, there's <clears throat> there's absolutely elements that I'm just absolutely passionate about. And it, 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 to me, that the people piece just drives me, right? I mean, we, we would not have the industry. I, I spoke about, you know, our project teams going to work every day during the pandemic, right? Yep. Every day. They're keeping us in business. They're the ones putting their lives on the line, right? Just like with our healthcare workers, or our first responders, our construction professionals, our trades people, every day. I think of the amount of work that got done. So when those things drive me at this point in time in my career, Adam, absolutely. I mean, I just, I get excited about those various elements. You know, behavior came up in the discussion uh, here today and that's again another one of those that just it's right at the top of uh, what I want to focus on in my remaining years in the industry and making sure our future leaders in the industry are absolutely the best and top-notch that they could be I'm probably not the same type of leader that we probably would have had in the industry 30 years ago but that's a good thing yeah, so when you're talking about skilled trade workers, I love you. Pound on the table again, like, yeah, let's get fired up. They were, I mean, we were deemed essential, right? Essential. Just as essential as healthcare essential. workers. In fact, healthcare workers can't do their jobs without skilled trade workers, right? And the, the lack of respect for skilled trade workers exists, and it's a real thing. And I think our workforce is suffering from it now. Yes. We're working on that. In your presentation, in the panel that we just had, we talked a little bit about behaviors. And again, I can feel you getting passionate about 
how people are promoted yeah. through looking at behaviors and not just looking at uh, their technical abilities, which I think from my, from my perspective, for too long we've awarded or promoted the best wrench turner or the best person who's technical abilities and, and not necessarily the best teachers or learners or leaders. And so I guess, can you touch on that a little bit? What, like, how are we, how are you shifting from promoting based on technical abilities to promoting based on behavioral abilities? Yeah, you bet. You know, I would say just kind of over the years, just to touch on the, the behavior piece. So probably about 20 years ago, I listened in on some training around situational behavior impact, SBI. And it, it really hit me hard because during that period of time, you know, we're out there executing work, I see promotions occurring, and I'm like, boy, that's really strange that that person's being promoted strictly based on the profitability when he or she was just an ass that you know, right? I mean, in all honesty, right? Yeah. Teed off the client, teed off the trades, but look how great my project is. Mm. And it just bothered me because I could always felt that you could still have a successful job and not be that type of person. Mm -hmm. So I really started to focus on the behaviors. It was pretty hard to tell like, hey Adam, this is what somebody told me about you. That That's meaningless. But if I'm having a conversation around Adam, this is what your behavior did to me. How can you argue with me in the impact that it had on me? You can't, that's your feeling. It's my right. feeling. So at least let's talk about it, right? I mean, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? But let's talk through the fact that we're in this client meeting, you're at the edge, you know, the individual's at the edge of the table and all they do is have their cell phone out the entire time, right? And so you walk out of that, you have the conversation, you address it. Because what was happening in our employee reviews, right? I'm sure it goes on everywhere. What is it you don't want to touch on? Mm -hmm. The tough conversation. Adam, you're a great guy. Keep it up. Fantastic. Oh, by, easy oh, 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 by the yeah. way, it wasn't being addressed. Mm -hmm. So I just am an advocate. I, I shared that with our up and coming leaders, right? You know, all the all the X's and Y's and Z's and whatever they all fall in, that's what they were looking for. And your generational categories. Generational categories, that's what they were looking for. The same way I would look at a leader 20 or 30 years ago is different, I think, the way our future leaders are really evaluating people. Who do they want to work for? That's what we want to just make sure we're doing. We have the best people in place, all rounded. Yeah. You know, I, think, I think behavior is going to just continue to be a huge part of that. Yeah, it's a different skill set as leaders of the next generation are being promoted. You know, those skills needed to be successful are changing, are changing. people uh, are changing. That, you're, that you're impacting. I often, when I coach teams, we talk about the elephants in the room. And I, I, maybe you've heard this one, maybe you haven't. And, and I always get like a bomb, so prepare yourself already, right? But, but so why can't you find elephants in trees? Don't know. Because they're really good at hide and seek. <laughs> yeah, you hear it, you feel it, yeah. <laughs> but the point being, right, we don't often talk about that one thing that nobody wants to talk about, right? No. And, and, and when we can acknowledge that one thing, then we're able to solve that one thing. When we can all see as a group, and then we know as a group, and we act as a group, we move so much faster forward that things just solve themselves. Yeah, I, I say definitely. And you have to, I think you have to know the, the audience. I, I share this. My son, who is uh, 27 years old, we're getting ready to roll out a, a particular program. And I was talking to my son about it and about kind of some of the rollout strategy. And he said to me, he says, Dad, the last thing we need are people like you promoting it. Hmm. And I asked him, I said, why do you say that? He says, it would look like too much of a check the box. Hmm. Not that you don't believe in it, but it's almost going to come across as too corporate, you know, if that kind of makes sense, like this mm -hmm. is the thing to do, versus I want to hear from, you know, the middle pack, the, the future leaders, the leaders that are going to be here 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, because those values that those individuals have are probably more aligned with me. Mm -hmm. And they're speaking from the heart, right, from the soul, in terms of what that is meaningful. And I, I just thought that was, that was interesting, that kind of even the messaging in terms of how 
the greatest impact might come from it has to be other things we look at. Yeah, I can more relate to some other people than right. Just making it look like it's a corporate thing, right? right. Okay, you know, you guys are, you know, just kind of doing what is the you know new thing there. But my son's in it honest enough with me that he can tell me those things though too. I like that, yeah. I think, so again, building that trust so we can speak up is absolutely out there. Absolutely. As we're trying to implement, and, and I love how you're kind of, you're thinking outside yourself, right? You're, you're looking at this situation, like how is it gonna be received from the people that we're trying to get to adopt this change? Absolutely. And then you change your own internal, but maybe it's not you rolling it out. Right. Maybe it's other folks. Absolutely. So, to give up that control, though, can sometimes be tough. How, how, are, how are you able to deal with letting go of some, especially after being a field general for so yeah. long? You know, I, I just think that you gotta look at, you know, probably just a lot of upbringing, other things, again, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. That's where probably the biggest parts of feedback come your way. and. I think it just helps develop that level of trust where people can come to you, they can share with you, whatever that might be. And again, I take pride in being behind the curtain and seeing it. You know, I mean, I'm not, I don't know what it's like to be, you know, the person up front, you know, orchestrating a fine tuned machine, but I enjoy being behind the curtain and just seeing it play out. And you're able to do that, I think, as you get a little bit later in your career, because all you want to do is see, uh, you're, you shared something earlier about, in Japanese, that, right, people don't retire. Oh, yeah, it, yeah, they give back. I mean, that's, that's impactful for me. You give back. Been in this industry 40 years. I don't want to go away. I do want to give back. So that really hits home. Yeah, so, you know, I, I mentioned my displeasure for the word culture a few times here. You actually have me really deep thinking about challenging the language concept and how important actually alignment of language is. Because I've always been like, yeah, that means stuff like that consultant lean, blah, 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 blah. Like I've had, they've tried to change me and it doesn't work. And, and so you've really got me thinking and, and I actually, newsflash, don't tell anybody this, I actually love the word culture. It's all a front. But you made us, when you said that to me the other day, you made me think. And, you know, as you know, I mean, the individual I'm here with, who is my honest guy, you know, partner from a business perspective, Leah Fiore, she wrote that down. Because what I heard was culture versus values. And we often talk about that company has similar culture to ours. And I said, let's begin to think about it. That company has similar values to ours. It seems like it's saying the same thing. And yet values, I think I can see better They're in a way. Tangible, I right? Can touch them. Yeah. I, I, of cult, I, anyway, it was just, I mean, and you, and you said it that way and it began to just make me think a little bit differently around, yeah, let's, Let's see how interact, you know, interacting those two words can be culture and values. So I, yeah, and it's like synergistic, right? It got so, so old after a while. And then we use culture so much, but why, why? What does it truly mean in that setting? Yeah, and, and the mission I think plays in there. Respect for people is- Oh, absolutely. absolutely, That term respect for people is so outdated in my opinion that- But where I would come back, with that little bit, Adam, is again, just from our perspective, why caring, right? Truly caring respect certainly comes into that. Because I mean, caring can take on so many different avenues. And again, I kind of share the example of someone struggling with the software on a job. Yeah. And the person challenged me, I mean, in, in a very good way, right? Dan, how can you say you care about me when you're making my job harder? And I don't have an answer other than yeah, you sure that I'm going to go back and figure out how we can make your job easier. But uh, anyway, that's just lots of it. But culture and values, that, that's one of my takeaways. 
Well, so, so Jen, and, and you just met Jesse. Yep. The, he's actually the questionator that I referred to <laughs> in my, like, that guy's telling me I haven't asked the right questions, but myself, him, and then Jen Lacey, who's the director of Lean for Robbins and Morton, we wrote a blog on culture and we started it with love, care, compassion, people. Like those are four words that you rarely hear in a blog dedicated to construction. Um, yep. We also discovered this cycle that we called it. You know, you got to have vulnerability and then you can build trust. And then you create as a leader the, the right conditions for affirmations to take place. And once you have that full cycle, then you just get a little bit more vulnerable. You build more trust and you create those right conditions. And it's this feel. And, and so as, as leaders, again, we got to look internally to figure out how do we set these conditions for people. And, and some people call it psychological safety. Because what do you do to make sure that the environments that you're in, that your coaching teams, like how do you establish that precedence from a psychological safety perspective? Again, that's a pretty deep question. I mean, I'm kind of thinking through it in terms of, you know, certainly we promote, you know, safety, you know, from the top down, right? I mean, bottom up, it's it's everyone is is in the same pool together, and. You know, the, <clears throat> again, I kind of go back in my career, even working with CII back in the 90s around zero safety, right? I mean, and the whole concept that you can't achieve zero, right? Zero is the only number, right? It's the only acceptable number. Okay, so zero always has to be their mind. So I think it's the, I mean, the psychological element is, you talk about it in every meeting, it's primary at the top, you know, you put your, you know, what you're saying when you go out to the field, you know, I'm wearing the gloves, I'm wearing the full PPE, making sure everyone else is. Leading by example. Know, leading by example. And just the way you go about planning the work. I mean, actually, you know, you're going to spend dollars to ensure that it is done safely. And I always, you know, it's kind of the old adage, but when you add safely, at the end of most sentences, it changes the way you're going to go about doing whatever that is. Safely. Yeah. Well, hey, hey, hon, drive home safely. You know, I mean, just there's somewhere just getting that embedded in my career. We went through, a, we were able to achieve the VPP Star Award on two of our projects uh, in my past. And the whole idea there that we were trying to embrace was. We had shirts for literally every day because we wanted, just in case someone was getting ready to just make a bad step, somewhere, somehow, you know, there was a message board. And we thought, no better way than to have a thousand message boards at any given time out there. You know, work safe, you know, all the different things, but just some way, somehow, you can't do too much as it relates to that, I guess, more than anything. So I, I think you just have to be constant, not in a negative way, reinforcing way, pointing out if someone in that isn't wearing their PPE, what could happen, we have all the experiences. As a company, we've moved the cash card hats. You know, one of the primary reasons is that it saves lives. We have it's the hockey helmet with the, with the strap. Yeah. More than anything, I it's got a strap. Gotcha. So that if someone was falling off a ladder, or someone was just That's falling, it. right? The normal hard part that falls off, what hits first, typically the head. Yep. And we've seen that in the industry. It's not easily adopted, but certainly we know it has to be done. So I don't know, always thinking of what can be done differently, just not assuming that everything we're doing today is is good. I love it. We're always improving at what time. I'm gonna ask you one last question. Okay. I know you got you gotta run. What advice do you have for that future builder who's coming up, right? Because you know, anything. In uh, life, I, in business, what do you got for us? <clears throat> I just think it's, it's just going to be an absolute exciting time. I mean, right, I mean, I we talk about prefab modular in the industry today. We don't even know what it looks like five years from now. The one gentleman spoke yesterday, right, 2025, and he kind of used that as a toggle. What was before is gonna be BC, right? It's truly gonna be before, I mean, versus after that, what it looks like. That to me is the most exciting part 
because I think construction as a whole is going to just take on, right? Because we have fewer people, we have to do things smarter, the robotics are going to be coming so much more of a bigger part in it. I mean, but I will share this, construction will always need people. I don't see that ever going away, Adam. We need people. Amen. And uh, without people, this will never happen. We can have all the robots and human learning machines that are out there, but we're going to need people. Yeah, focus on people. That's yeah. just what people, lean builders people, do. People. You bet. And, and I think that's what drew me to you when I heard your presentation right. today. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. You bet. And I uh, look forward to continuing to learn with you. Thank you.